This is my 50th video on my work with OO Gauge. See part 1 of this series for my reasons for getting into OO Gauge when I already had a lot invested in working in N Gauge and I didn't really have space available for a large fully operational OO Gauge layout. Also see my lengthy series on my N Gauge railway modeling for smaller and more complex scenery and smaller scale trains running. This part is the 24th dealing with my third layout made using mainly Hornby set track. See the prior video, part 27, for my reasons for wanting to try a Hornby set track layout when I already had an OO gauge layout using Bachman Easy Track. This part covers my build of the Metcalf GWR Signal Box Kit P0330. I'm actually modeling the LMS, not the GWR, but I don't really see why this signal box couldn't appear somewhere in LMS territory and I decided to build it to make the secondary signal box for my Hornby layout, basically just to ring the changes, as I'd already built the other Metcalf signal box kits before, some of them more than once. Here's the kit as it comes, fairly slim for a Metcalf kit, but still a bit heavier than super quick kits. Here's the back of the package. No footprint diagram on the back of the package for this one, but there is one that can be downloaded from Metcalf's website if you need a footprint template. And the images from Metcalf's site are sized correctly, so if you just print them original size based on image DPI, they should come out the same size as the building will be. As a thin package, this one was even trickier to slit open with a knife without damaging the parts. I do wish Metcalf would provide some easy way of opening these packages. They did have terrible dotted lines on the packages of their early kits, I seem to recall. Here's what you get when you take the kit out of the package. One folded sheet of printed card parts, a second smaller sheet of printed card parts, three sheets of laser cut parts, a nicely laid out sheet of glazing parts, a standard Metcalf sheet of ridge tiles, and instructions in the form of two folded sheets. Unusually for Metcalf, there are no grey heavy card parts included with this kit. I've said before that my preferred format for the instructions is the stapled booklet that Metcalf seem to be using for their most recent kits. That format is easy to handle, doesn't take up much space, and avoids any confusion about the order of things. This kit uses the intermediate format. The instructions are still on large folded sheets, but at least they proceed page by page, treating each side of the fold as a separate page, rather than meandering all across the double sheet as Metcalf had them doing for a while. This kit has another feature that's very unusual for Metcalf, and the instructions make a point of clarifying this. This kit includes parts that allow you to make up the box as either brick-built or stone-built. But only the main wall and chimney parts are duplicated once in each finish, so there's no way you can build two signal boxes from this kit. You can just build one box in either brick or stone finish, and the wall and chimney parts for the finish not used will just be left over and can be discarded though I never throw anything away that might be potentially useful, so I keep the extra parts in case they might somehow come in useful in the future. Not that I know what for, but you never know. I decided to go with the stone finish, again basically just for a change, as all my other signal boxes were brick-built. I never follow the Metcalf instruction idea of separating all of the parts out at the start and arranging them in a builder's yard, as they call it. I feel that would just take up more space, likely confuse me, and probably lead to losing parts. So I keep the sheets off to the side from my main work surface, and only take out parts when I'm ready to use them. Here are the parts for the main box walls, the walls themselves, and window frames and glazing parts. All of the blanks for the window and door openings are removed. They generally pop out quite easily with Metcalf kits. This kit perhaps needed a little bit more persuasion than usual with a knife here and there, but it was still fairly straightforward. The transparent glazing parts glue to the back of the card window frames. This is easy to do as the parts are large, so there's plenty of space to apply glue without getting any on the actual windows. 
then the window frames glue to the back of the actual wall, with the large parts strengthening the walls, and also in one case providing an overlapping connecting tab. The walls do need to be handled a bit carefully in this initial state, as the connection by the door opening is very thin and could be easily bent or even torn. The walls fold around, and the tab provided by the extended window frame part is used to join the back wall. These are the parts for the lower door. The door glues behind its frame. Then this assembly glues inside the walls. This now strengthens that weak spot by the door opening. The inner floor for the box is just a regular printed card part rather than the heavy grey card that's generally used for floor formers in Metcalf kits. But then this is quite a small building. The tab folds over and is glued to the bottom side of the floor. The floor then fits inside the walls, with the extended piece strengthened by the doubling tab protruding over the lower door. This is rather a tricky fit, with the wall needing to slide into the slot between the main floor and the step on the side of the protruding part. I found it easiest to fit the floor first without any glue, and then to glue it in place by applying glue to the underside of the edges from the inside. Here's what the assembly should look like after the floor is fitted. The structure is quite square and rigid at this point, reinforced by the large window frame parts and held to its form by the floor. Now the upper windows can be assembled and placed. There are three large frames with corresponding transparent glazing parts. The glazing parts are glued to the back of the frames. It's not difficult with such large parts. I don't know about you, but with Metcalf parts like this, I don't use tiny spots of glue, as the instructions suggest. I just use thin, continuous beads of glue. But I do need to resort to tiny spots, sometimes with smaller parts, such as those in super quick kits. The upper window frames then glue inside the walls, further strengthening the overall structure of the box. Now comes a tricky bit, and the instructions actually make a point of warning you that this is a tricky bit. The box is to have external timber framing, and this comes in the form of laser-cut thick card parts. I found these laser-cut parts a little tricky to separate from the sheet they came in. The laser cuts just a narrow groove, and those grooves are considerably finer than a knife blade, well, finer than my knife blades anyway. So getting into those grooves to separate the parts is tricky. You can't really just run a knife down the groove, as the knife blade won't really fit into the groove. I found that sort of progressively pushing the tip of my knife down into the groove worked best. Using a razor blade might be another approach, as that would probably actually fit into the groove. Once the frame is out of the sheet, all of its openings need to be cleared. This is fairly easy. Some of the blanks just fall out, and the attachment points are very small, so you could pretty much get away with just pushing the blanks out, though I actually cut down on the attachment points with the tip of my knife if the blanks didn't fall out. The frame will need to wrap around the outside of the upper wall in this form. It's quite tricky to glue the timbering in place precisely without getting glue where you don't want it. You start with the wall by the door, and this is the trickiest, as the timbering needs to go into the groove between the doorstep and the wall, where there's barely room for it, sitting level with the bottom of the doorstep. The framing also needs to sit neatly round the window and should come to just below the top of the wall. And, of course, it has to be glued in place with glue applied to the back of the frame itself, where there's very little space. Once the frame's been started by gluing it to the wall by the door, the rest of it wraps around. It's a bit easier to glue these parts, as you can just apply glue to the back of the frame and then carefully fold it down into place. You do need to sort of guide it so that it fits precisely round the window frames and under the gables. The instructions say that the frame should be flush with the tops of the gable walls, but I found that was not really possible. If I sat it round the windows and level with the doorstep, it came a little bit down from the tops of the gable walls. Here's the box at this point, with the main framing glued in place all of the way round. 
These are the parts for the wall that will go round the porch. Again, the window frame extends from the end of the walls, providing a tab. This is another framed window that also needs to go inside the porch walls. This window frame exactly doubles the inside of the gabled porch wall. Fitting these walls to the box is again a bit tricky. I found it easiest to glue the section to the rear wall first. The tab on the end of this goes behind and joins to the other original half of the rear wall. The bottom of this wall slots in beside the floor on top of the lower wall. Then the little notch in the bottom fits up against the corner of the lower walls with the drop section beyond the notch gluing to the side of the protruding porch floor. Once that section of the wall is glued firmly in place, the remainder can be folded round and glued to the porch floor, with its ends slotted inside. I glued the slotted end of this wall to the end of the wall and window frame by applying glue from the inside after slotting the wall through. These are the parts for the porch door. The door is glazed and then glued to the back of its frame. Then that assembly is glued inside the porch wall with the doorstep protruding under the door. These are the parts for the chimney stack. Again, regular printed card parts are used for the formers, which Metcalf more usually make with heavy grey card. The seven formers are all glued together into a stack. I always find it a bit tricky to get these stacks exactly square. I keep pushing one side square, then something else looks a bit out. The tab on the bottom of the flat part of the chimney is folded round and glued to the back. This will fit into the space in the walls locating the base of the chimney. The upper section of the chimney stack wraps around the formers, forming, we hope, a square assembly. The chimney is then glued to the back wall, with the tab at the bottom fitting into the space in the walls and the folded top section of the chimney sitting in the notch in the top of the wall. The instructions say to ensure that the chimney is up against the end of the timber frame, but given that the chimney is essentially positioned precisely by fitting it into the notches in the wall, you don't really have much control over this. Still, it didn't come out too badly. So this is what the rear wall of the box and the porch look like at this stage. That's the end of the first sheet of instructions. Now on to sheet two, although sheet two only actually has three pages as against four for the first sheet, so we're more than halfway through. There is another laser cut external timber framing piece to go around the porch. This starts on the rear wall up against the side of the chimney and fitting around the window, and then wraps around the porch and over the door. Now the roof can be prepared. This part will make the main roof and half of the porch roof. The tab on the side of the porch roof section is folded back and glued. There isn't much wiggle room when fitting this roof, as it needs to fit around the chimney and the tab needs to fit inside the porch. I glued the complex side around the chimney and to the porch first. I just glued the roof to the tops of the walls. I didn't put any glue around the chimney as I didn't want to smear it. Once that more complex side of the roof is in place, the other side can just be folded down and glued to the walls. There is another small piece that is glued in place to make the other half of the porch roof. The instructions said that it might be necessary to cut the notch at the back of this a bit to make it fit. Actually, I found the reverse. The notch, if anything, was a bit bigger than it needed to be. Laser cut parts for the barge boards are then applied. Both the barge boards themselves and their spacers are laser cut parts. At the porch end, there are two spaces. The first one glues under the gable roof, essentially just completing the timber framing. Then the second spacer glues on top of the first, extending over the timber framing at the left end. Then the barge board itself glues over the top of the spacer. The barge boards for the other end and for the porch only have one spacer each, as there's already timber framing under those roof edges. 
Here is the porch barge board in place. And here's the barge board at the other end of the box. Now we come to the steps, generally one of the fiddliest areas with signal box kits. The super quick signal box kit just gets around this by giving you a ready-made complete plastic stairway. This kit uses the same approach as the other Metcalf signal box kits I have built. You need to assemble the stairway using individual steps, but a jig is provided to help you do this whilst keeping the steps square and level. And this is the laser cut part for the stairway assembly jig. The material needs to be removed from the slots and all of the joints need to be eased to bend. The small tab at the bottom towards us here is folded over and glued to the back. The top pieces of the jig fold around and slot together. I found it easiest to slot the pieces together first, which is kind of fiddly as they need to sort of slide inside each other. Then I applied some glue afterwards. Appearance is not important here, as this is just a jig. It's not going to be part of the final building at all. Here's the assembled jig. It provides two slots to hold the sides of the stairway parallel and rising at the correct angle. Now we need to make up the sides of the stairway. The main inner risers come as one laser cut part, seen at bottom here, with additional laser cut parts to make a former. The former parts are all glued together in a stack to make a solid piece. Then the former block is glued under the top platform of the stairway with the risers folded over and glued to the sides of the block. The instructions say to get the risers square. It's not really possible to do that, but so long as the former block is glued centrally under the platform, the jig should hold the risers parallel. Now additional frame parts are glued to each side of the risers. These are clearly labelled R and L for right and left, and you need to take care to put them on the right way round. So you end up with an assembly like this, which you can see is clearly a stairway going up and turning to the right. It just doesn't have any actual steps yet. Now that assembly is inserted into the slots in the jig, which will hold it properly formed and parallel whilst you glue the steps in place. For some reason I found this one a bit trickier than the others I have done. Perhaps my memory is playing tricks, but it seems to me that even the smaller N-gauge steps were easier to do. You have to put a little glue on each end of the bottom of each step and then position it with tweezers and glue it down to the risers on each side. You need to press the step down to get it to sit flat on the riser on each side, but you can't really press down on the middle of the step as I found since the step parts are not very strong and they'll buckle if you press down on the middle. You can see that my fourth step from the bottom is quite badly buckled. Fortunately, you only need 11 steps, and Metcalf give you 12 parts, so I was able to take out my buckled fourth step and replace it with a spare one. If you damaged more than one step, I suppose you might be able to carefully cut an extra step from the leftover sheet. Once the steps have been fitted, additional framing parts are attached to both sides of the stairway. Well, railing parts, I guess, really. Then there are some post doublers to be fitted. I found the instructions rather confusing here. Can you understand them? I eventually realized that the key was that although they mention five longer posts, you're only using two short and two long posts here. The other long posts may be used later. Well, two of them anyway. So, two short post doublers are glued to the outside of the posts at the bottom of the steps. Two long post doublers are glued to the outside of the left posts at the top, and the L-shaped piece is glued to the right side of the top. There's now an optional platform. That is to say, you can either have the stairway going up with its top landing directly outside the porch door, or you can have the stairway going up to the other end of the wall with a short walkway between the porch door and the stairway landing. It seemed to me that we might as well have the walkway. Here are the parts for the walkway, basically the same as the top landing of the stairway, a folding platform and formers to make a block. The formers are all glued together in a stack to make a solid former block. The sides of the platform bend down. Then the former block glues under the platform. 
Now parts are glued to the side of the platform assembly as railings, and this is where you use another two of those long doublers. The walkway assembly glues to the wall, slotting under the porch doorstep. Then the stairway glues to the wall and to the other end of the walkway. I was pleased to find that the fit was good, and the stairway actually went to the ground level properly. Nearly done now. Just chimney top and ridge tiles to do. Only one chimney pot is needed, and it's made in the standard Metcalf way by cutting a coloured strip of paper from the instruction sheet and rolling it into a tube. I use a bamboo barbecue skewer for rolling OO gauge chimney pots. Once the pot's rolled like this, glue needs to be applied to the flap and the tube closed up. In my experience, you're always going to get glue on the outside of the pot and on your fingers when you do this, so there's no use worrying about it. Once the pot is rolled, its ends need to be coloured. I use marker for this. There are three pieces to make up the chimney cap. The three chimney cap pieces are glued on top of each other to make a stepped cap, and then the pot is glued to the top. You have to use a fair bit of glue to hold the pot firmly in place. Then that cap goes on top of the chimney stack. The standard Metcalf ridge tiles are folded in the middle. I do this over the edge of a metal ruler. Then the fold needs to be coloured as best as possible so that it doesn't show white. Strips of ridge tiling are cut to length and glued in place on the ridges of the roofs. I find it best to use two fine beads of glue, one down each side of the tile strip. And there's the back of the finished box, a bit out of focus, I'm afraid. The box was the same size as the template that I had for it, but that template included the walkway and stairway, so I painted the area under there grey. I also had an area of the template showing at the side of the shop and cafe, so I painted that grey also. Here's the shop and cafe back in place after the paint dried. And here's the signal box in place. This is how it will most often be seen, as this is the view from the controller. This box does have rather large windows. Perhaps I should have fitted the interior. I did actually think of getting the Metcalf signal box interior kit, but I forgot that idea and closed up the roof during the build. Here's the view from the other side. It looks nicer this way, but I have to have the front windows facing the tracks. Here's the view across the Hornby layout at this point. Finally, no more paper templates. Though I do have quite a few more buildings still to do, they just didn't get templates. Next up will be the Super Quick Island platform building, which I'm hoping to use for the far platform of my station. Although that isn't really an island platform, so I shall have to fiddle a bit.